Tonight, President Obama is speaking at two events, two fundraisers in Washington, D.C. This week, the president spent most of his time traveling the country promoting his new big jobs bill. Uh, but tonight's schedule had to be fundraising for obvious reasons. The number being thrown around for how much each party's candidate uh, will raise and spend in the 2012 elections this next year is a billion dollars. A billion dollars for each campaign, which is frankly hard to believe. In 1976, the president was Gerald Ford, uh, which itself is a little hard to believe. Gerald Ford got to be president because President Nixon's vice president, who he ran with, Spiro Agnew, uh, he had to resign after being charged with bribery. And then Nixon himself, of course, had to resign because of Watergate. And so the president ended up being a man who had never run for president or even for vice president. Gerald Ford got appointed in scandal to be vice in 1973 and then got elevated from vice in scandal to be president in 1974. And he never had to run for those offices. Never had to run for president, certainly, until two years later in 1976. And when he ran to keep that office he had bizarrely found himself in in 1976, his own party almost didn't let him keep that job. Gerald Ford faced a ferocious primary in the Republican Party from Ronald Reagan. Gerald Ford did beat Ronald Reagan in that primary that year, but the primary was brutal enough that he essentially stumbled into the general election, as best demonstrated here uh, by the Chevy Chase impersonation of a uh, very, very stumbly Jerry Ford on Saturday Night Live. And so in 1976, Gerald Ford faced off against Democrat Jimmy Carter in the general election. You want to know, as their party's nominees, how much money Ford and Carter raised to run against each other? They raised nothing. Zero dollars. Their general election campaign was funded instead by money from that little checkoff on your tax returns about whether you want your one or two or three bucks to publicly finance campaigns. In the next election, too, in 1980, when then-President Jimmy Carter ran against the man who had taken so much skin off Ford's hide the last time around, when he ran against Ronald Reagan in that epic battle, with the presidency having just righted itself after the Watergate nightmare, how much money did Jimmy Carter and Ronald Reagan raise for their campaigns against each other that year? They raised zero. They did not raise campaign donations for that general election. It seems impossible now, but it is not that long since we did it that way. Today I came here to Atlanta to interview former President Jimmy Carter on the occasion of the paperback release of his White House diaries. I went to the Carter Center. I was very excited uh, to meet with former First Lady Rosalind Carter. I saw the museum there, which was cool and sort of unexpectedly high tech. Uh, but the reason I came to Atlanta, the reason I came to the Carter Center, was to figure out if, for the billion dollar election era we are in now, there are lessons that we should remember and learn from the zero dollar election era, which is not that long ago. Uh, I would not have expected it before I spoke with him today, but former President Carter, it turns out, is optimistic and optimistic for sharply analytical reasons right now about how the presidency of Barack Obama is going. Watch. Reading your um, White House diary, one of the one of the things about this diary that actually does seem like a time capsule is that you reflect on your dealings with Congress and specifically on how on some issues like the deficit you mentioned and on national security, members of Congress make decisions without regard to partisanship. That these are things on which people vote their consciences and what they believe is best for their constituencies. Party doesn't really figure into it. Sure. There are no issues like that anymore, no. it seems, uh, in Washington. And as that environment has changed, do you feel like you have any insight into how to actually govern well in an environment that is so much more partisan than it was when you were in office? Well, this is completely different, as you said. I, I had excellent results in dealing with the Republican and the Democratic uh, majority in both the House and Senate and had an outstanding batting average because of that. In fact, it was a better batting average than any president except Lyndon Johnson since the Second World War. And, but, but I had, uh, in the last two years I was in office, I had the partisanship in the Democratic Party because at that time, Senator Ted Kennedy decided to run against me and some of the more liberal Democrats didn't want to see me have successes. So I, had, I experienced a little bit of what President Obama experiences every day. That is an almost total reluctance on the part of any Republican in the House or Senate to give him any support they would bring credit to his administration. So he has a difficult, almost insurmountable problem in dealing with the Congress. And so it's, it's totally different. And I think the whole uh, episode that we've just described in Washington, the, the environment, 
is mirrored in the country. The country was not polarized when I was in the White House or when I ran for office either. And that's been brought about by the unlimited infusion of enormous amounts of money into the political process. Not only during the campaign itself, but after the campaign's over, the lobbyists have unlimited funds to pay, you might say, for votes in the House and Senate, which makes it possible for the uh, environment, for the, for the groups that are special interest to prevail over the well interest of the, of the general, general public. And, and we never had a lot of that, that uh, extra money is spent on just uh, the technique in campaigns of tearing down the reputation of your opponent, negative advertising. I never knew that. You know, I referred to, to Gerald Ford, who was incumbent president, as my distinguished opponent, and he referred to me that way. I did the same thing four years later with Ronald Reagan. And we didn't even accept any campaign contributions. Mm. It's hard to believe. But we just took the $2 per person on, on income tax returns, and that's all we spent on our general election. So it's a total environment. When you, you mentioned the interest of, of funds, uh, of campaign funds, but also lobbyist funds, yes. one of the things I marked to talk to you about today Good. was when you noted in 1977 you're working on your energy legislation and you right. are getting a lot done, as you say, a great batting average, but you're frustrated that the energy piece is not moving forward. And you say, it be, it's become obvious to me, it's on October 13th, 1977, <laughs> it's become obvious to me that we've had too much of my own involvement in different matters simultaneously. I need to concentrate on energy and fight for passage of an acceptable plan. We've not been able to do it in a quiet, unobtrusive, unobtrusive private way with the members of the Senate. The oil lobbies are too strong. You elsewhere That's describe the, the oil and gas lobby as having unbelievable influence. What, what's the right way to to fight that influence, what did you learn? The only way to do that, if there is a way, is to, is to draft what, what the president thinks is the right proposal and then completely override the Congress in taking that proposal to the people directly hmm. and use a powerful influence, the bully pulpit of the White House to prevail, if you can prevail. And I think, I think reluctantly, and, and maybe not too late, but quite late, uh, President Obama has learned that. For the first time, with his jobs proposal, that was drafted in the White House, and he made the proposal to Congress in a very effective speech, one of his best ones, and now he's taken his case to the public to say, okay, this is what I propose, this is what the Congress is likely to do, choose between me and the Congress in the upcoming election in 2012. I, I, I'm not bragging on myself to anybody else's detriment, but every major legislation that was introduced in the Congress while I was president was drafted in the White House hmm. with my staff under the leadership of Stu Eisenstadt. And we would bring in the top leaders of the Congress from the House and Senate to sit down with us in drafting the legislation. And if the chairman couldn't come, then their staff would come. And so when the legislation was introduced in the House or Senate, the Congress was already deeply involved in the process. They modified it, obviously, with amendments. So I had to accept then either to accept the amendments, to try to change the amendments, or if it got too gross, which is very rare, then I threatened to veto the legislation. But President Obama has not done that at all. Mm. Uh, he has basically said, okay, like on health care, let the five different committees in Congress develop their own proposals, and we'll see what comes out of that, and then we'll support what they come out with, and in my opinion, it was the lowest common denominator. Mm. On the Jobs Act that he is pushing yes. for now, that he is using the bully pulpit for now, he has drafted legislation, this American Jobs Act. Do you, exactly. think, that he's do you think that he's doing it the right way with this? I do, and I think Jobs he's going to succeed. For the reasons I just described, mm -hmm. I think the public is going to decide that he is right and the Republican opposition is wrong. That's one thing. The other thing is that he has very wisely put in his $450 billion package over half of it is tax reductions or tax grants to private individuals or to corporations. And, and that's something that appeals to Republicans inherently. And the other part, you know, to, to repair school buildings and, and to roads and bridges, I think is also something that Republicans might very well buy. But in an election year environment even, I believe that they'll take over half of a total package of what President Obama has proposed uh, in his jobs bill. And I think if they don't take the rest of it, it's going to be to the disadvantage of the Republicans in the election next year. Substantively, do you think that the policy will work to improve the economy? I think it'll have a minimal impact, but a positive impact. Hmm. Limited, but positive, yes. Ultimately, we've got to deal with the enormous debt. I basically had a balanced budget, very slight deficit. <clears throat> and of course, President, uh, President uh, Bill Clinton had 
a positive budget as well. But when Ronald Reagan came into office, he spent like a profligate and uh, developed an enormous indebtedness, a deficit, and other presidents have done the same except for Bill Clinton. So now we owe about, I think, $14 trillion to American investors in bonds and also to foreigners like the Chinese in particular. And, and, that's, and, and it's, it's destined now, if nothing changes, to go up to more than $20 trillion in the next 10 years. That's almost an unbearable burden of debt and interest payments on the debt. So something's got to be done about that. But eventually, I think the Congress will come to its senses of working with the president and have a package both of increased revenue and also increased reduction in some of the privileges that have gone with the social programs. And that's not, that ought not to be sacrosanct. You know, for instance, just look at me personally and, and Social Security. I've earned a good bit of money in my life, and I have a very substantial monthly Social Security check. You know, I could do without it. I could do without part of it. I could pay taxes on it. Mm. So those are some of the things that can be done in a flexible arrangement that I think would not be deleterious to the president or to the Congress in the long run, and would be beneficial to the country. As Democrats look ahead to what's going to be a difficult year, uh, really, I think, for any incumbent, including the incumbent president running, just because of the economy, um, should they be drawing battle lines over Social Security and Medicare and so. Medicaid and saying we will protect them and the Republicans shouldn't be trusted with them? I think so. Social Security is a, is a treasure for our country and precious to people like me, whether they are affluent or, or not. Uh, and it's, uh, it's an inheritance, you know, from back in the New Deal days, mm -hmm. 1930s, during the Great Depression. And I think that one of the uh, serious mistakes that uh, Governor Perry has made is ostentatiously condemning, in effect, the Social Security system. And he's been jumped on by Romney and others because of that. I think if he is a nominee, and that looks to me like the most likely prospect in the Republican side so, so far, I think that will really cost him a lot in the general election next year. Mm. Uh, and I think if the, if the Republican candidates continue to do things like that and appeal to the most conservative elements <clears throat> within the Republican Party, they're going to lose their support in the general election next year for president uh, among the independents and among even the more moderate and I would say sensible Republicans. One thing to note about President Carter that he mentioned there, but that bears a little explaining, is what he called his batting average. The successfulness of Mr. Carter's presidency, and this is also true of the first President Bush, uh, the success of those administrations is frequently assessed purely on the basis of the fact that they didn't win a second term, which is true. Uh, but it is also true that in the post-war era, the two presidents who were most successful in getting their own legislation passed by Congress were Lyndon Johnson, naturally master of the Senate, right, and Jimmy Carter. Does President Carter think that President Obama is going to win a second term? I don't think anybody's going to beat Obama uh, next year. That's next. Please stay with us. Rick Perry mm. endorsed you in 1988. <laughs> yeah. All right. Yeah. Will you return the favor? <laughs> right now and endorse Rick Perry. Well, it it would hurt him a lot. In yes. <laughs> Republican primary. So, is that an endorsement? No, it's not. No. So, because an endorsement would hurt him and you won't endorse him, isn't that in itself an endorsement? Um, you could put it that way. Wait one second, though. Texas governor and former Texas Al Gore campaign chair Rick Perry is not the only former Democrat on the Republican presidential candidates roster this year. Among the Republican candidates this year is uh, someone who volunteered for your presidential campaign, uh, Michelle Bachman. I know, and uh, I appreciate that she helped me out. She's, um, <coughs> I would wonder, I, I would love to overhear you two <laughs> getting the chance to talk now, uh, given how her politics have evolved. President Carter on Michelle Bachman, on Rick Perry, on Mitt Romney, and on President Obama's chances for getting reelected. That's next.